Uh, we're live hey. with Federico, so trying out a new Hello there. a new streaming setup. All right. Um, hi, Brian, Wenty. Um, yeah. So we've got Federico, and we've got a bunch of projects from the community, and we'll be sharing some demos. We've got... Um, a sliding box, and Federigo is going to be showing some pop-up projects. So stay tuned for that at the end. And yeah, so we can start with some projects from the community. Um, this is a Truchet Tiles project. Am I saying that right? I, that's how I've heard it pronounced, Truchet. But. The idea of it is that you have this kind of tile and you randomly rotate it. So these are like some random rotations of it. And then based on the random rotations, you get all sorts of cool examples. And this one was originally shared by Forrest. I think Federico actually did the first Truchet Tiles and Cuddle, and then Forrest shared this one, which was, I guess, a about a proposal for um, sort of some public art on the ground. Yeah, I think he wanted to, so the, I, I, I guess they installed the, these sort of permeable tiles in the, the train tracks in, in Helsinki, and like, and um, he was going to propose to them that they randomize the, the rotation of those tiles because um, basically, you know, you, you could make more interesting patterns that way. Ah, I see. Mm -hmm. And um, then later um, this week or last week, oh, okay, so then this one is um, a Truchet Tiles Exploration for a quilt that Forrest and his partner made. Uh, I particularly like how he he implemented the, the ones that are controlled, that are not random, because uh, he did an array. So you select either a light or a, bl or a black tile, and then you select the number of rotations on the on the rotation pattern. So I think it's a, the, using, using just a simple array with numbers is, seems like a really fun way to control your... Yeah, that's really cool. So you still get kind of a lot of variations, yeah. but you don't, but you, you, but you don't lose the control over the final design that you sort of lose when you give, like hand the wheel to random, the random yeah. number generator. Yeah, for the top one, it, it works. Uh, you can do like sequences of zero, one, you know, one, one, zero for, I think zero is the dark one and one is the, is the light one. Mm -hmm. I see, switch on and off, zero and one. Mm -hmm. So it's cool to see the ones that he generated. You can actually sort of see, go see the code in the, in the array. Do you want to take over? I'm going to turn off yeah, the air sure. here so that we have better sound. Yeah, sure. So let's take a look at how this is um, how this is done. So we have a tile repeat, and mm -hmm. then inside of this, then we have each individual tile, and then we're selecting a pattern uh, from the rep. So the rep is coming from. Um, oh yeah, we should we should be showing we should be showing rep in here because um, so rep is coming from this tile or or sorry rep is be, is coming from this linear repeats. I'm correct. Yeah, there's this is kind of complicated. Um, yep. <laughs> so okay, no, it's not actually. So this linear right, repeat well, is just a straight up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's um. Something that I wanted to do with these live streams is like save the things that are technical for the end of the live stream. So um, I think I probably shouldn't have started with all the these touche tilings. <laughs> the reason I was showing these was I thought it was interesting that um, 
layered paper art made this really nice um, piece out of like multiple layers of cardstock. Um, and this was originally, it's a remix of one of, of this one that Forrest shared. Um, maybe at the end we can go into trying to figure out how how the customized repetitions mm -hmm. works on on this mm -hmm. project. Yeah, that's really cool. But yeah, the texture that layer paper art gets is like amazing. That uh, super yeah. dense multiple layers is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it looks like maybe multiple different mate like materials on on different layers. At least it they, they, they look mm -hmm. sort of. Um, s some of the layers look a little bit darker, and some of them look a little bit lighter. I really like the color scheme on this. Yeah, it's a really sweet palette. All right, but and then that's that's an appropriate username. That, that's a lot of layers. <laughs> Should we see if there ever was one? Yeah, we can switch back. This was a cuddle project I saw on Twitter that um, Daniel Sosabi is making a board game. And I looked it up, and this, it looks, it looks pretty cool. It's, it's some sort of, so it's a board game called Sneaky Town. And my understanding is that it's in playtesting now, but Daniel intends to release this as a, um, a board game that you can you can buy and play with your friends. Two player game takes five to ten minutes, and the um, the board he's been prototyping different layouts using Cuddle um, using the parametric features. So that's really cool that we're enabling Daniel to. Um, quickly iterate on this board game. So I thought that was really cool to see. Yeah, I need to look at this and see how it's actually played. It looks, I mean, the board design is really interesting. So mm -hmm. it it's like intrigues me. Yeah, the board design is cool. It's like a sort of weird, that Y shape is, looks pretty slick. Mm -hmm. This one, is um, a project by Brian Wente that he shared. He said he was um, just like exploring this Geneva mechanism, I guess, as a mechanism for a counter. And the idea is that you have this continuous rotational movement, but it like sort of ticks this other um, this other spinner here, and. This is the Wikipedia page for this kind of mechanism. And I thought that it was cool that like, um, this is used on old film projectors because you need to advance the film a single frame at a time and then flash the light and then advance it another frame and then flash the light. And the film can't be moving while you're flashing the light, otherwise you'd get like a streak. It would be blurred, right? Uh -huh. And then, this so this is running at high speed and then that's what makes that sound that you mm -hmm. hear with like old film projectors like tch, 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 yeah because uh, it's just doing this at you know 24 frames per second or something i wonder if brian made it parametric because his example has five um oh yeah it says wheel slots five. is a oh, oh yeah that's so cool Super cool yeah <laughs> you can change how many slots it has. Um, That's very nice. Various sizings. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty cool. That's... Oh, yeah, it's very unique. Like I've seen, I've seen a number of people using this mechanism, but I haven't seen a, a nicely generated one for number of slots. Yeah. What happens if you do two slots? They break. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, I maybe don't... maybe some of those yeah, that... other things would need to be changed in order to yeah. to get there. Yeah, that requires another type of design, I guess. I don't. Yeah, would two slots even? I don't know if two slots would even work because it. 
I guess. Yeah, because would you be able to pick up the... Yeah, because it, it would that. be right on the, on the axle, so it wouldn't... Hmm. <laughs> Cool. Challenge for Brian now. Uh, make yeah. <laughs> make a two slot one. <laughs> uh, uh, Brian Wenty says if you do ten, you do a, a counter with a rollover. What is that? Is oh. that? Huh. Oh. I don't is, know what that means. Is it? Is is there a difference in how it works with even or even an odd numbers? All right, I'm going to go to the next. Um, really nicely done. This was a spinning top designed by Eric Steele. And it has slots for putting coins into as weights. So um, you can change you know, how many coins get in there. And then everything is set up so that the whole thing assembles and press fits together and um eric has a video showing like sort of different so this is with the it fully loaded with all the coins um but then you know trying out different amounts of coins it's and even spinning on a coin oh yeah it's <laughs> also spinning on a coin And then with no coins at all. Kind of runs the best with no coins at all, seems. Well, he says excellent balance, but the duration isn't as long. Uh, uh huh. Without having as many coins. Mm hmm. Because there's less energy, there's less kinetic energy stored in the, in the motion, I guess. That's really cool. Um, another Eric Steele project that I liked was this. Um, this is a way for adding fractions together. So it's basically just taking, um, you know, using like say two rulers to add the numbers together, um, but it's on a spinning, um, it's a circular pattern so that you get, um, it, you know, rolls over from zero to one, if that makes sense. And um, this is all parametric and I assume also uses uses these um, this um, customized repetitions, which is the feature that you guys were playing with in the Truchet tiles. Um, this is one of the advanced features, like the customized repetitions, the idea is that um, you know, normally, if you have something and you have a bunch of repetitions, each repetition is going to be the same. But if you do this, customize each repetitions, then you now have this rep variable, which you can use um, in um, parameters. So like the number of points of the star, I can make it one plus rep, which is going from zero to five. And then you get something like that. Yeah, uh, so it's a useful way to do things like this, where you want to, you, you have a bunch of things and you want each, each one to be slightly different. Um, so you can mm -hmm. do that without writing a lot of code. Yeah, so um, without this, they would all be the same. Um, the same number that's rotationally repeated, but by using customize each repetition, uh, Eric is able to change the number on each one, on each repetition. Yeah, this is a cool use of that, making like slide rulers. Cause this is like an example of a circular slide rule. Mm -hmm. Another fun project from Eric this week is this. Um, I don't. What do you What do you call this? It's like a thing it's where like, you. Um, it's like a pachinko machine, or, or like a yeah, um, yeah. Basically, like 
yeah, like so the. I, I forget what the actual goal in, in Pachinko is, <laughs> like whether you're supposed to like get it into a particular slot or um, or what, but um, but basically it's sort of like a, a, a way of like randomizing the, the output. So like if you put it in anywhere up at the top, like you're going to get sort of some random distribution of possible places that it could end up. So it looks each like each time it can move either to the left or to the right. So you start mm -hmm. here and then they'll sort of bunch up around the center, but there'll also be some on either side. Yeah, so you can and see so he's you, always yeah. putting it in at the center on the top. So I think this is sort of visualizing how probable it is that it 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 that the ball kind of goes to one side or the other and sort of like in an ideal like if you did this enough times with like a big enough thing it would look like a bell curve is, is kind of what he's suggesting here, maybe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those are nails? They well, look like nails. There are but... these holes, and they can be controlled with this pin diameter um, setting. And... Yeah, I mean, then you can stick whatever you want in there. I I guess maybe they're nails, or like um, yeah. golf tees, or I don't know. Like, mm -hmm. uh, uh, they they kind of look like those old school nails, like the really big, like sort of uh, like, like a roofing nail. I like how the head of the nail creates the it keeps the balls in there because yeah, that that becomes that, cool. that becomes the. Mm -hmm. And then it lets you see through. That's a cool, yeah, cool way to do it. Uh -huh. Yeah, because yeah, there's no mm -hmm. like there's no transparent layer or like uh, acrylic layer on top. It looks like mm -hmm. it's just just the nails. Yeah, because I've seen other versions of this demonstration with an acrylic uh, mm -hmm. front, but I, I think this is cool with just the nails. The sound must be cool too. Yeah. Um, I think I can play it, but I'm not, sh I don't think it's, uh, oh, it my stream isn't set up for it. Maybe it can be heard. Looks like it's playing through. Yeah, yeah, yeah I can hear it. <laughs> yeah, that is a nice sound. Um, so those were some projects that we saw this week. Um, Something that we've started doing in Cuddle that I wanted to call out because I thought it was kind of interesting is we're starting to like use it just as a graphic design tool. I had, um, with the jigsaw puzzle, I had sent out this um, comic strip sort of version of it. And normally I would make this in like Figma or OmniGraffle. Like those are sort of, classic graphic design programs that I've used. But we're starting to experiment with just like making graphic design using Cuddle. And I thought it was pretty fun. Uh, worked out pretty well. You know, I was able to import my images. Um, I was able to crop them using uh, the Boolean intersect. So like this image is actually like larger, but then by adding a rectangle with rounded corners, I was able to crop it. Um, I also made an arrow. <laughs> and I, I ended up implementing this as a custom modifier. So you can take any path and <laughs> add an arrowhead <laughs> to it. Um, and it will automatically like point at the end of the path. Um, I feel like this one would be good to have as a built-in at some point. Um, it'd be nice to be able to like, just drag out an arrow mm -hmm. and then be able to um, customize it. Um, oops. Some other um, graphic design applications. Forrest was working on this stencil, and this was all... Um, just done using Cuddle. Um, it's nice because you can get like um, 
like there's a rotational repeat here and so you can try out different amounts of repetitions um, for iterating through your your graphic you want to talk about some of these? Um, yes, these are just, um, I, I had been posting videos onto YouTube um, and I needed to make some thumbnails for them. And so I just, you know, decided to use Cuddle. So basically this is pretty simple, just just some text and then and then a quick little mask. And um, so if you double click in into that shape, you can see there's just like a, a really quick and dirty um, mask over the uh, the guy on the skateboard there, mm. and uh, and then I use uh, uh, flatten to just take him out and make it look like the text is behind him, um, and so that's been a pretty quick way to do these um, to the like do these thumbnails. You know, it takes me like maybe five minutes or something to do each one. So I like it. And what are what are these people doing? <laughs> uh, they're they're <laughs> racing, so they're racing um, uh, skateboards and uh, electric unicycles, and that was like an event that I went to a couple weekends ago uh, down in um, Apple Valley. Nice. Um. Cool. Well, those those were some of our graphic design experiments using Cuddle. Um, you know, Cuddle is made for physical things, but it's been interesting to play with it for more digital things. Um, yeah, I like I like that you're able to do these masks. I think that's really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was using that technique. Um, I think maybe Federico like initially in, like introduced me to that to the technique of, uh, of of tracing something just by placing um straight lines and then using the bend uh tool so um mm -hmm. so you basically just like you trace it in a very coarse way and then you kind of bend the the um the the paths into shape cool so even you're doing that now because you're yeah. <laughs> you're like a illustrator old school yeah like i've seen you with the pen tool yeah i'm pretty i'm pretty okay with the pen tool but it's sort of you know like w w when you zoom out you kind of can't really tell either way so it wasn't really worth it to me to go in and like to really fine tune it and get the the masks perfect just because like it's gonna be a tiny little youtube thumbnail in the end so this is using two recent features both the um images and custom Font. So this is a font that you mm -hmm. found on the internet and yep. uploaded in there. I wanted to show a work in progress uh, template that we'll be releasing hopefully next week. It is a um, sliding lid box. So it's a box like that and then the lid slides out and um, the channel is just a engrave. So um, to do this, I had to figure out like what the um, engrave depth should be. And I made these gauges. Um, here, let me show some of the... So first of all, this is this is what the template's going to look like. It'll let you change the size of the box, material thickness, um, you know, tab width, and then these these channels automatically get get cut. Um, it get engraved, sorry, into the sort of top sides of it. Um, sort of all the sides except for the right side, which is where the, the lid goes. These were some earlier prototypes. And most of all, like, I think the hardest part for me to get right with this was the, uh, the channel. Like, um, I this originally messed up that part, but um, by the third prototype, I had it had it worked out. And that that little half moon for pulling it is that engraved as well? 
Yeah, and that's just, I thought, for giving your thumb a, a grip mm -hmm. on it. Um, in the comments, Ralph is saying, nice book. Yes, this is, um, so Laird Paper Art sent me this packaging book, which is really cool. Um, it's, so I guess Laird Paper Art in, I suppose a previous life was a package designer. And so um, he's like, like this is a really pro package design book. I hadn't seen anything like this before. Um, it's very thorough. And what I like about it is that it has like all the words, like um, I love learning the vocabulary of different disciplines. This one's cool. Um, so thank you so much for sending me this book and I'll, um, I'll keep looking through it and I'm sure it'll inspire a bunch of things. Um, so back to these, um, so anyway, this, this channel, um, needs to be like engraved to the right depth. And so I needed to figure out like what are good settings for doing that. And I had made this um, sort of tester project. And the idea is that you cut out these depth gauges like this. And then what you can do is you can see, you put it in there and you slide it. And so this one, it hits there, which means that this channel is um, deeper than 0 0.04 inches. Uh, 0 0.05 also doesn't work, but then 0 0.06, goes all the way like it doesn't hit. So mm -hmm. I was using that to measure the depth of various engraved settings. So let's see if we can get it to. Yeah. Yeah, so it's pretty cool. And then one that doesn't, so 0 0.05 won't actually go all the way. Oh, no points. You have to you have to push it uh push it pretty hard. And yeah. So then so that it's flat against the uh, thing. So it's it almost goes. Uh, yeah. Uh, so almost, it's somewhere it's, it's it's yeah, pretty close to 0 0.05. Um so yeah, I was I was testing various settings on on my Glowforge um and yeah, for the most part, like with these MDF kinds of materials, it's pretty consistent. So I tried it with both like what Glowforge calls draft board, which is just sort of straight MDF, and then what Glowforge calls medium maple, which is MDF with a veneer layer of um, maple or walnut or like whatever the fancy wood that you get is. And those were pretty consistent, though with the veneer, it was slightly shallower. And then I also, yeah, tried it with the what they market as um, light plywood, which is not MDF, I think. Is that? Yeah. Do you know if that's is that correct, Federica? The it looks, light. It looks like it's sort of. Um... Not sure. I think it's not MDF. I think it's just like yeah, maybe a normal. It has like a grain on the on the edge. I don't know if the cameras are gonna gonna focus on this, but yeah, you can see there's like a grain on the edge. So. Well, anyway, the the light plywood like is much more sensitive to engraves. Um, like the same setting that normally wouldn't do much would like sort of cut all the way through. Uh, Brian went to saying it helps to run a waste piece through the yes, grooves before you assemble. Definitely. Um, so basically when you mm -hmm. um, you do this engrave and then there's like a ton of soot that's just like stuck in there. So then you take something else and like just sort of go like that and it cleans it out. Um, 
and also like a toothbrush also can mm -hmm. help mm -hmm. uh and then yeah there's, there's you can even see some yeah. soot coming off of there um so yeah you definitely have to do that in order to get a consistent sort of flat channel um but i'm thinking i'm gonna make a youtube video showing like all the steps of doing that um and what i learned making this i wonder if it makes a difference so I'm noticing that there's that there's some some debris like sort of backed up at the end mm -hmm. of the channel. Like I wonder if it makes. I'm guessing th th this was engraved lengthwise. I think what I think it was just my cleaning. Oh, I see. Uh, uh -huh. It was not getting um, getting see. it so all you, the way. If you went in there with like a toothbrush or something. Yeah, I think I could get that out. I see. Um. But yeah, so the, this is um, that project for making the gauges and then also for these engraves um, being able to make multiple uh, tests was pretty helpful um, I ended up finding that like doing sort of three at a time and then like recalibrating myself was a good way of doing it uh, Brian Wente comments an old carpenter's trick is to use is to use a rubber bar of soap to lubricate the channel hmm, hmm. Uh -uh. try that yeah another trick i use sometimes to lubricate wood joints is uh, just uh, a pencil like the graphite you rub some graphite on it and it slides really nice it huh. downside is that it of course it creates like a gray streak on it um hmm. so you just take a pencil and just draw in the channel like you mm -hmm. just draw in here i see yeah, because like you know, they use graphite to lubricate locks because it's a it's a dry lubricant. But yeah, soap soap is cleaner, says Brian, for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, soap is like the definition of clean. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then the final thing we wanted to share was um. Federico's been doing some pop-ups. I mean, Federico's always making cool projects that he shows us on uh, our team, like meets on Monday mornings and he's always showing us cool things. So I wanted to like have him on, uh, on the live stream to just show whatever he's been up to. Um, yeah. What's on your mind these days, Federico? Yeah, so I, I recently finished this long project that was like, I use Coddle a lot for it. Um, actually, I set up a little video here. I'm gonna I'm gonna show you my screen real quick. Um, so this was the one I just finished, which was um, I wanted to make like a zine I'm that not told your like screen. a. Oh, shoot, sorry. Uh, oh, there you go. Uh -huh. Okay, cool. So the idea is that I wanted to make like a like a sort of like children's book type story with two characters um, that I kind of like produce myself. So all of the drawing was done in Procreate on an iPad. And then all of the paper mechanics were like worked out in Cuddle. Um, and then the, this one is cut and scored on the Cricut. Um, so I kind of had to do a lot of figuring out the workflow for that one. Um, I like that one, that last one. So the thing I found out is that um, it takes me, <laughs> I mean, like I finished the production and it takes me about 40 minutes to assemble a, a single zine or a single, you know, book. Um, so I'm trying to like optimize that. But like some of the things I learned making this one was that I, um, yeah, there are like a lot of a, a number of tools I kind of created in Cuddle for myself to make the assembly easier. So, like as, as I went along, I would like create different things. So, for example, um, one of those things, like I think the ones I ended up using the most was like like a simple tab and slot system. So I'm gonna show you the screen again. Um, so, so I have. Um, so I created two components, a, like a tab, I call it the flat tab and a slot. So the idea is that 
for example, if I have a piece, let's say I have a, a piece I want to attach somewhere, I drag this tab on it, and then I use the handles to place it in the corners. And so the tab is a little bit inside um, because the idea is to assemble it on a flat section. And so this tab, um, I set it up so it tells me what slot length do I need. So for example, if I'm going to put these onto another piece of paper, um, let's say here, then I know that the slot for that one is uh, 0 0.8. So I drag this slot component and I just make it 0. I make the link 0 0.8. And so these would go in there. Sorry. The, once these are joined, then that would let me like stick it in there. And then I made my slots actually like not just a single cut, but like a, um, you know, like a, a, a bit of more thickness. Mm -hmm. And I think this is like a, my bread and butter, <laughs> like this, this slot and tab. Mm -hmm. um, and, 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 you know, I made it so like I could place it in different angles and, and things uh, like and that. It always is the right length because you've, you've set the length. Yeah. And it always is the, the right length. Yeah. That was, that was the idea. Once you set the length, it stays in place. Um, And so, so the funny thing that happened after I finished that project is that I felt like I wanted to like do more like free flowing because like the the one with the possum and magpie took a lot of planning per you know per spread. It's like I had to like figure out. Uh, I mean, I had like I feel like I'm still kind of figuring out the workflows. Like sometimes I come up with an idea for what the image is going to look like. And sometimes I come up with an idea for the mechanism and they sort of kind of co-evolve. So for example, like for some of those, I started um, kind of documenting. Let me see if I can show you one. Like I started sort of documenting all the stages of my process. So this is like a sort of assembled booklet of, uh, of, of the process. So. This one started with kind of ideas for the mechanism. And I made these mostly by hand. So I, this is like a sort of pivot mechanism, which is really fun. So each, you know, each spread is like a next step. So I came up with this idea of like a symmetric pivot. Then, you know, I was like, oh, cool. So I could have like a symmetric pivot here and then another one here. Um, and then I was like, oh, so I, I wanted to make, you know, these to be one character and the other one to be another character. I was also like trying to work out like how big it would get there. And then that I kept on playing with that. But then now I, I made these two kind of like the same piece, but then I was working out with different things. Um, and so at that point I simplified it. I was, I, I decided to do like, you know, one character on top and one at the bottom. Um, and so at this point, when I kind of had the image kind of worked out, um, I kind of jumped and made it, um, uh, like digital. So this one is like, I made it in Cuddle and then I made the illustration more elaborate. And then I just started to work out like different things. So for example, here, like the tail of the bird kind of like catches, and I was trying to figure out what to do with the tail of the, of the possum. Um, so this is kind of like the next evolution in which I kind of made this one do something different. Mm -hmm. And then I figured out that uh, the, the tail over here was giving me too much trouble. So I just drew it inside. Um, and that's kind of like getting, getting very close. And I was just kind of working out here. It's like too tight. And this ended up kind of being the final one <laughs> where I kind of got that could, like, I like this like kind of feeling of when it kind of pops, uh, so nice. So anyway, like I've been documenting like my, my processes in these like things. That's <laughs> and such then a cool way to, 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 to like keep track of your, of your process, like, and, and then it ends up like creating this artifact that, uh, yeah, I, I think these are like, 
yeah, like fun. Because the other thing is that whenever I'm working on these, like my desk is like full of random stuff everywhere. <laughs> so at some point, I, and then if I store them, um, when I started like storing them in boxes and then they were like unmanageable. So I decided to start like kind of binding them into like a little storybook like that. So they, th this is like another, I can show you a, a quicker one where like, you know, I had this idea for, for like the character would be here and there would be something like the wing, we would do something. Um, and I didn't end up using these, but I, I thought it was like a, a fun kind of pivoting. Um, and then here I was, I kept on trying with the idea of like the bird would like lift the wing somehow. And I didn't like this one because it, it just kind of separated things too much. Um, so I kind of yeah. moved on. And then this is, this is like the one where <laughs> like, I, I was really happy with how the wing uh, popped out and it's, it's a bit elaborate, but it uses the, oh, wow. you know, at some point we were making those, uh, those videos with the, um, with the linkages. Mm -hmm. So I think it's visible there, but I, so that one uses like a linkage to pull the wing yeah. and then the wing itself has a, another linkage here. And so that was kind of like me working it out with the linkages. And then this is just like the simple version of that. But I had to work out, you know, how much that wing would pop. So here I eventually had to cut it. Um, and this is like doing the same, just working it out with two, like a V. And this one you can see that I, I, I then turn it into the illustration, but then I here I had to figure out how much the wing, you know, I wanted kind of like the two wings to move, but then I guess that wing didn't fold quite right. Um, and then this one, the mechanism for the bird is working, but then I just wanted to add like a, an additional element in front. And I think this is roughly the final. So the, so I get the wings to move and then I have like a, an added layer with the mushrooms in front. And so um, um, I'm curious, like th those, almost all of the last couple of ones were cuddle cut ones or were those by hand? Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So I usually start by hand mm -hmm. and then, and then I quickly kind of, I mean, once I have an idea of what I want to do, I move into cuddle and, and start like, you know, um, designing the pieces and then like making the digital cuts and, you know, testing them. And then after I test them, I can like make modifications to like figure out like things that, you know, cut into each other or things like that. Yeah. I feel like the, um, like I remember when we were making the sun seeds, like we would have to do like 10 or 20 iterations, like changing like really small things, but it's really important to get the action right. Or like what, when you were mm -hmm. showing some of the things like, oh, the wing would run into something else. And so we need to mm -hmm. change the angle or change, just move something over a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. And that was actually like a big part of why we made Cuddle was like, we were originally doing Sunseeds like an illustrator and programs like that. And like to do another iteration would require like all these extra sort of menial tasks in order just to produce mm -hmm. the iteration. Um, so like what we want to do is make it so that you can just quickly iterate another. It's like optimize the iteration speed, I guess. Yeah. Um, and, and exactly like that's how I use Cuddle for all of these is that I think that that's where like com the ability to separate things into components shines a lot because like Sometimes you're making change to, changes to specific components. And so you just change that, but everything else remains the same. And like, I can show you like, a, you know, one of the, how are we doing with time though? Like, how far I'm do we want to go? super interested in this. So okay. let's just keep going. Um, um, yeah, I wanted to show you uh, one of these, the later ones or I think have a lot of, have a lot of like things separated in components. So let's see screen. 
So here you can see that the one I showed you where the two characters kind of pop out. Mm -hmm. um, another thing I ended up having to do a lot is um, with Cricut, there is only a certain usable area. So, um, so I mostly cut them out of letter size um, sheets because that's what it fits. So there would be eight and a half by 11. Um, but then, but then with the print then cut feature, only this area ends up being usable, which is a six and a half by nine and a quarter. So, so I like to, because I'm using the print cut, um, because I, I put the illustrations on it. I always have to sort of design with this constraint in mind. Hmm. Um, so that's one thing I end up doing a lot is just keeping that. But then I did, I do separate everything into components. So I have like the page, the uh, page size then the flat tab and slot I showed you before. Mm -hmm. And then each one of the characters is separated into a, a different component, which allows me to, you know. Can I ask what are those red guidelines? Those are the folds, like the, oh. the, these are the scores for where the things fall. Cause like on the cricket, I use the fold wheel or the, you know, the, mm -hmm. sorry, the, the scoring, scoring wheel, wheel to, yeah. to, to create the fold. Um, but yeah, so when doing like little adjustments, I end up just having it separated in components. So I can like, for example, when the tail, the moving the tail around came, I could do things like these. And then, but then my, all the scores remain in place. I think that's like a really nice thing to, and then my layout to send it away, it stayed in place as well. So I really like, I really enjoyed that workflow of like, you know, being able to make changes to the piece without messing too much with everything else. Cause I could, so if we can look at the, yeah, some of the spreads and that are being more complex, uh, like this one, this one is the mushroom one, but as you can see, like I'm, I'm also trying to fit everything on that, in that usable area, the six and a half by nine and a quarter. Um, so this is like nice to be able to, and when I'm doing the drawings, the, to, to match the drawing to these pieces, I what I do is I export all of these as a PNG. Um, and that becomes my guide to draw the, to sort of place the illustrations on the iPad. Oh, uh huh. So that, that's kind of like one of the workflows I ended up like uh, falling into a lot, which is like essentially make the, um, make the mechanical part work then do the layout and cuddle the cut layout that fits into that square and into that rectangle. And then I do the, you know, I place the illustrations on top. Uh -huh. So you have the illustrations done at the time that you, um, make the, like th that you go into cuddle or, or they're just sort of roughly sketched out and then you do the fin the, the, the final version after. Yeah. Yeah. They're roughly sketched out and I, I end up doing the final version once I have like all the mechanical stuff, because yeah, I was saying that, for example, with the tail, I end up doing like little changes of like how long it is. So it doesn't hit other thing. Yeah. So, so I ended up doing the final illustration towards the end when, mm. when like most of the mechanics worked out. Um, but the, what I was going to say is that after finishing that project, I decided to start another one that was like, that was like more free. <laughs> like, uh, I just wanted to improvise more. It's like, sometimes you, I feel like sometimes I go, I work into a project that requires a lot of effort to get to certain places. And then the one I started next, I just, I was like, I just want to like play and, and move on sort of. So th that's the one I'm working on right now, which is, um, um, I thought it was interesting that I was, so I started using Cuddles, uh, like the image trace. So, uh, the image, uh, um, so this is, you so this is how I ended up doing the, the image import. Yeah. Uh -huh. Sorry. Like more heavily. So for example, this one, this one has like a quick process. So you'll see there are only, so there is this one, which is entirely made by hand. Mm -hmm. Cause I was like, I just want to improvise everything. I kind of have a, a sense of how it is. 
then I took all these pieces and scanned them and I traced them in cuddle. And so I made these, which was the, the blank. Um, and then once I had that, I exported the image and then I did just drawings on top. Um, so there were like fewer back and forths. So, you know, this one is like a three step. I can show you the cuddle project to see the, um, I think I still have the image there. Oh no. Um, oh yeah, look at it. No, okay, let me show you this. So, Huh. So, so that's I, your trick. So I, uh -huh. Your scan. So I, yeah, this is all like I did it all by hand, and I mean I did keep track of certain dimensions that I wanted to to do, um, but then after I had it, you know, scanned in a flat scanner, what I did was I traced the shapes, you know, with the usual technique, uh, and once these were traced, uh, I was able to like. Um, you know, for example, these are the hands. Then I added those tabs in the right places and the folds. And, and so you can see each one is, this, is essentially the same concept where like I, I traced it, added the, added the tabs, and then I added the corresponding tabs on the, on the page. And then I generated that cut file, which is, you know, the one that, this one I fit in a, you know, letter size. And then I use these as a base for the drawing. Uh, um, so I guess as I, as I get more familiar with the, with that kind of workflow, um, I feel like I, I get, I don't know, I can produce something a little faster. This one is a bit similar. Um, the, the, so I did the second, let me show you the, the second one I did is that it has, I'm, I'm a big fan of these like spinning. Um, yeah. So, so that circle spins, but then I could add these little extra things poking out. So this was my only like handmade prototype. And then with this one, I simply like I kept track of the dimensions, and then and then I kind of just sketched this one out directly in Cuddle. So I wanted the sort of eye shape with the spinning thing and the, and the things poking out. And once I generated that, I, then, then I added the illustration on top. Yes. Yeah, this kind of like, <laughs> reminds me of like Neon Genesis <laughs> angel type thing going on. Yeah, it's definitely like uh, completely accurate angel territory. Yeah, yeah. So, that was like a, like a much quicker, but I suppose it was because, so this is, this is what it looks like in Cuddle. Um, so yeah, fewer, com in, in fact, like there's something that I don't do very often, but like these component for the spikes, um, I did use one and then, and then I, I simply scaled it uh -huh. um, to make a little smaller version. I love that mechanism with the, that you're able to make it spin. Like yeah. That. It's kind of surprising that it has that motion, but it's so satisfying. Federico, yeah, that's pretty much my super fun. Um, are you selling the zine or is it, um, is it a special on your Patreon or like, what, what did you end up deciding <laughs> with that project? I no, that. I decided I want to sell it. I just haven't had time to produce it. <laughs> I suppose. I suppose. Uh, I mean, now is the time to sell them for. Oh right! Yeah, you got it. You for Christmas have, gifts. But... Like one week to get it together. <laughs> Shipping <laughs> yeah. and all that. <laughs> yeah, I was. Yeah, good. You mentioned that. I. I was. Because I was. I was documenting the process on Patreon. Um, for all of these. Then, in a way, it feels like, I. 
I already like sort of got paid for <laughs> for the design. Um, the, but then I still want to make for people who still want yeah, to have still copies. Yeah, like, have the, yeah. the thing. Um, and so, yeah, we should so um, to, put your Patreon I need to do it. in the in the chat. Um, or, or just the description just, afterward. Yeah. Where, or, or what is the name of your Patreon? Uh, so it's uh, Patreon slash Wolfcat Workshop, which is the name um, I go by about everywhere. Um, All right, I can, I can show it quickly here. Um, yeah, I've been really enjoying um, your Patreon updates. Yeah, so. So my yeah, my goal is generally to do like um, one update a month, where I, or sometimes two, but where I kind of go into detail about how these are done, and you know, I was just mentioning this whole thing about the usable area, and so I, yeah, I try to document the process and and show how it goes, and then I I add other things I do, but yeah, so the the one. The opossum and magpie is kind of like very deeply documented, I think. Like about each each separate spread has a has like sort of inspiration or where things came from. <laughs> yeah, it turns out Australian magpies like to hang upside down, and that's <laughs> that's where the idea for the upside down magpie uh -huh. came from. Yeah, and so sometimes I go deep into text, and and sometimes I I create a video that kind of shows the you know, all the different things and I kind of try to explain it. Um. Well, I definitely recommend this Patreon to those who do the Patreon thing. And uh, yeah, it would be great to to have copies if if you can figure out a production workflow or mm -hmm. maybe you can buy an unassembled one and then... <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. I know it takes so it a long. You're saying it takes a long yeah. time to uh, actually assemble the pop. Yeah, I, I mean, I got it to about a half an hour to uh -huh. assemble one. Um, yeah, cool. I was debating with myself that um, you know how much would I charge for each one and things like that. But well, it'd be um, great to have some of these in the world. Uh, I'm looking forward to it whenever you are yeah, able soon. to put it together. Um, yeah, awesome. Well, awesome. Yeah. I think that's that's good for this live stream. Um, this is a long one. Yeah, we'll put we'll put um, links in the description, um, especially for all of Federico's work, and um, I'll definitely put in the new the Cuddle newsletter if you do end up making those zines, because um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people in the community would be interested. So thank you so much for nice. sharing thank that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was fun. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Okay, bye.